Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Three Works program. My name is Nehid Mansour, and I'm the Senior Manager of Programs at the Gardner Museum. You will notice your mics and videos are muted and the chat option has been disabled. However, there will be a Q&A following today's conversation, and so we invite you to send us questions through the Q&A function at any point. Also, please note that this program is being recorded and live streamed through Facebook Live. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that Toronto is located on the treaty lands and ancestral territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Pitoon, and the Mississaugas of the Credit Nation. The community we work in is the home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. We are grateful for the opportunity to learn and live on this land. Today, our guest speaker is Linda Swanson. She will be in conversation with Sequoia Miller, the Gardner Museum's chief curator and curator of RAW, which is currently up in our exhibition hall. Linda will speak to one of her works featured in RAW, as well as two other works related to the theme of substance. I'll now turn off my video and mic and hand it over to Sequoia. Great, thank you, Nahed, and hello, everyone. Thanks all for being here. It's an exciting afternoon or evening for us to be um, uh, all here together uh, to hear from Linda Swanson and to uh, and to look at her work together. So, hello, Linda. Welcome. Thank you. Hi, Sequoia. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'll start off um, with a short uh, introduction of uh, Linda's bio, and then we'll go right into looking at some of her work. So uh, Linda Swanson is an artist whose interests are grounded in the metaphoric nature of ceramic materials and processes. Her work engages the enigmatic properties of matter at an elemental level and the capacity of wonder to question how and what we know. Her raw and kiln-fired ceramic works have been exhibited internationally in the United States, Europe, Asia, and Canada. As Nah had mentioned, her work is part of the Gardner's current special exhibition, Raw, which is on to you now through November 9th. Swanson is currently in residence at the European Ceramic Work Centre in the Netherlands, while on sabbatical from Concordia University in Montreal, Quebec, where she teaches ceramics. And again, thank you, Linda. Great to see you. Great to see you too. I feel like I'm really one of the lucky ones to be uh, over here in the Netherlands. And uh, um, it seems that I was able to get out in a little window and uh, and uh, work here at this um, yeah. center. I think, I mean, even sort of being out of, um, out of our living rooms or out of our apartments or homes or anything feels like a luxury, let alone being in a different country. It's like almost beyond conception. So we'll, we'll, I'll ask you lots about the, um, about the work center there, but for now I want to start off um, with your work. And so I'm going to share our um, slideshow and get that rolling. Okie doke. So I believe that folks should be able to see now an image of your artwork in the gallery of the gardener. And, um, and I'd love to start, uh, start talking about this piece. So this is an artwork called, um, Tem well, I call it Templum uh, for short, but the full title um, you can see there is Templum of a Precious Thing of No Value, a Shapeless Thing of Many Shapes. Um, I would start off um, maybe by just asking you to describe this piece, um, Linda, what are we seeing? What are we seeing in this moment? And then what do we see over time? Well, we're looking at a field of dried bentonite clay on the floor and the spots are appearing in the dry clay from water dripping down through these uh, nylon membranes suspended up above the piece. And so there's this connection between something up in the sky or rather referring to up in the up in the heavens and, uh, and down on the earth. And so the water is slowly dripping over time and as it does so, it interacts with the dry clay, which is a clay called bentonite. And this clay has the property of being able to expand uh, exponentially. Each particle can expand up to 15 times its own size. So it swells and bulges and seems to act of its own accord. Almost like it has a life unto itself, yeah. Right, it almost feels like it's alive when you're, um, when you're seeing the formations that it makes as it kind of bubbles and, and um, bulges. 
And uh, over time, it absorbs water and it also contracts as much as it expands. So there's this kind of movement that maybe is related to, you know, kind of larger earth movements like tectonic plates and that kind of thing. So uh, the more water is added, the more it kind of swells and the more it dries, the more it kind of uh, shrinks, uh, shrinks apart into new formations. So you can see that dried uh, section around the edge. Mm. When I one thing that I love is that you you make this connection to tectonic plates, which is very much at a sort of planetary scale. Um, and there's also, a, for me, a connection with um, breathing, with that sort of expansion and contraction of the swelling of the bentonite is almost like breathing. And in a way, it's been wonderful um, to, to see your work in the gallery for this time because I, I get an, I, a, a different sense of the time of it sort of swelling and contracting. Um, does it, I guess my question would be whether it feels like breathing to you in a sense, whether there's an allusion to breathing and, and what your thoughts are about the connection between the, the sort of bodily and the planetary in this piece. I think that's a really nice observation. I hadn't really drawn a connection to breathing per se, although there is something cyclical in terms of the way that the materials kind of um, acting. I think that one of the things that you experience in the piece when you're in front of it is the pace of the dripping water. And that's really the kind of action that we are actually experiencing in time. I think you um, have the uh, um, wonderful opportunity to see it regularly. So you get this sense of the, the change in the formation, but that doesn't happen um, unless some of you or comes back and sees the, sees the changes happening. Um, so that pace that the water is, um, is making does seem like a pulse almost, depending on um, how quiet the gallery is, if you can hear it, which it's, it often is um, quiet in the museum or quiet in exhibition spaces, like it um, is if you are out in nature and have the experience in a cave, for example, and hear the water dripping down, which was really where I started to think about using water in this way, was this experience in a cave in Iceland. And that pace of the water feels like a pulse and it does really relate to your own kind of sense of your consciousness of your body, as does I think the formations, which maybe we get the sense of a little bit in the image that you're showing that there's something kind of uh, intestinal or internal organish the material is wet and feels kind of um, alive or at least uh, kind of sustained in a way. So the other way that I think we're relating to this with our body is just the scale. And that's why uh, I'm making these at this scale so that we have this sense that it's, it's something that we encounter um, in terms of um, uh, a scale that we understand in relation to our body, as opposed to something that's very, you know, kind of tiny and holdable. This is really, um, really architectural scale um, and something we're kind of used to relating uh, with our bodies. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. And actually the way, when, when you're saying that, I, I love the idea of, of pulse, actually, that like really is, um, is, is wonderful to think of the water dripping as, as a pulse or as a sort of a movement of a of flow or of a blood or of circulation through your body. Um, and it's also reminding me of the, I don't know if you remember if you were there at that moment, but at the, this exhibition actually opened in March before the pandemic, like just before the pandemic. So we were able to have the, the opening reception. Um, and that night, like the piece had just sort of been started. And so the water was just starting to drip and, and they're like, folks were like on the, <laughs> on the edges of their seats, kind of like waiting for the water to drop because you could just kind of see the droplets forming on the bottom of the membrane. And people were kind of in anticipation of that 
um, that pulse kind of being activated is, is wonderful. But the, the thought that I, um, that you gave me as you were speaking was uh, around scale and body and thinking of the space between the membranes that are hanging and the, um, the platform say is in a way like the space of a, of a body. It's maybe six or eight feet. It's a little bit taller, maybe than many of us, but, um, in a way, as you were saying that I was imagining, um, sort of standing there or floating there, maybe might be a better, might be a better way of thinking of it. Like the notion that the, the sort of empty, the emptiness or the empty space in the center of the work, right. And the area between the membrane and the, and the clay is almost like a space for us to imagine ourselves being or to occupy or to transpose or something. Yeah. I think it's a space that uh, is separating also the, the membranes from the earth. It's, it's hard to get them all in one um in one view, unless you step back from the piece and then, but you want to get close because you want to see the details, hopefully. Um, and so that kind of forces you to put them together kind of imaginatively um, when, you, when you're up close, it kind of needing to look at one and then the other and uh, draw that connection. But it is a, a wonderful space to have worked in because it is it does really allow for a lot of room. I think this is the highest uh, membrane that I've been able to, to hang just because of the incredible height of the ceilings in this space. And because of that, we really get this sense that those, those membranes are hovering. Mm -hmm. and, and that there's a kind of suspension um, and the tension of maybe kind of wanting to place yourself in there and kind of hold them up is is the fact that they feel like they're they're dripping down or they're dropping down. I think that for me, the other thing about the space between the, the membrane and the clay is that it, that's the space of transformation, right? That's kind of this it's sort of the mystical part of the work in some way. And I, I think I want to ask you about that, about that link between in between the material and the spiritual or the um, material and the mystical, something like that, because it seems to be happening in that zone where the water drops, where it's not like fully water and it's not fully clay, but it's in that sort of generative in-betweenness. So I, I'm wondering how you think about that link between the material and the, and the spiritual and how, how consciously do you try to materialize the spiritual or to, um, spiritualize the material? I think that's a really good question. And I think that uh, that word spiritual means a lot of things uh, in our world, a lot of things in different ways to different people. And one of the things that I like to do is maybe to, which I did in the title of this piece, is to link to a kind of archaic um, time uh, of ancient Greece, ancient Rome, and a time when uh, materials and uh, forms had a kind of ritualistic aspect. Um, and in those rituals that are kind of conjured through the title, there's a kind of symbolic meaning that comes into the piece more than, and, and I think that it also does lend itself to a kind of mystery. But in this, uh, in this case, there's this kind of cosmic order of the universe um, that's alluded to with the idea of templum, uh, which was a form that was drawn in the ground by an auger in the ancient Roman times. And it was a four part drawing, like this is a four part, uh, four, four spots on the piece. And in that drawing, there was a connection that was made between the order of the cosmos, which was seen as perfect in the heavens, brought down to bring a small area of order in the chaos that was the world. And in that, in that ordering, um, there was the hope um, that that there would be a success for that area, that city where the where the templum was being drawn. So I guess in this piece, maybe I'm alluding to that hopefulness in terms of that 
cosmic connection um, or that cosmic uh, ordering that is getting pulled down and hopefully uh, bringing some of that that way that the uh, universe uh, works to our world, which is seemingly more and more um, out of our control and out of, uh, and uh, yeah. Um, it's interesting to think about this idea of, or, of sort of ordering chaos, or, or I don't know if it's order versus chaos or, or whatever, like ordering chaos, maybe it as, as poles on a spectrum, thinking of, of that within these questions around, um, around a sort of the politics of ordering, basically, like what do we, um, as, a, as a society or as societies, what do we gain and what do we lose through ordering? Um, what are the what are the risks maybe within um, within an overly structured order or sort of who controls the order and how is the order kind of maintained or policed, let's say. Um, um, I hadn't thought about your work in those in those terms maybe so much before, but I'm, I'm wondering, um, sort of speculating on sort of where the limits of order are and where the limits of chaos are and mm -hmm. how each of them has um, aspects that can be generative, I guess. Yeah, I think so. And I think that, you know, maybe our um, world order, in a sense, is through science uh, these days. And maybe this harkens a little bit more to your, your other question in terms of the spirituality. And that is how maybe through the making of this piece and the way that the drawing is made through the sense of the materials doing it themselves. While I set up a form in order for these uh, transformations to take place and to happen, there is still a, a kind of mystery to the way that these transformations happen, to the way that a particle can absorb water and take form and on a very, very small, simple way. It's not quite as simple as maybe a science experiment, kind of one-to-one. -one. There's a little bit more complication in this setup, but there is something brought together with this understanding that we have of the world that's really abstracted through scientific laws and a certain kind of um, uh, power that we have over the natural world um, because of the knowledge that we have generated through science and that kind of needing um, and a sense of the experience of the material uh, starting again, maybe in this kind of very introductory way and maybe that's also um, why I'm linking back to these kind of ancient ideas that just kind of reintroduce this kind of um, separation of light and dark, um, water and land that comes at the very beginning of many mythologies and religious texts. This kind of very simple sense of order, maybe not on the scale that you were just describing, but just this very uh, elemental division so that we might encounter it in a way that we think about it again and not assume that we know it and not assume that we know it fully. Yeah, right. Absolutely. That's a great point. The, uh, the idea of knowing it or knowing it fully. And, and I, I, I love what you said around, um, around the notion of systems and sort of setting up uh, a, a field of activity to happen. And I think actually the next work that, that we'll be talking about is a, is a great one to pick up this notion of, um, an, of an artwork that is, um, that is a structure or a system, a, a sort of field of activity for something to happen over which you have um, some anticipation, but not, not full control. So um, I'd ask you maybe to start off by introducing us to what, um, to Umphilos and how it, how it works and what's happening. Yeah, this is a piece that's also quite related to the templum piece because there's a membrane that's suspended up above and this time the membrane is holding salt water and it is dripping down on a compilation of ceramic vessels and these vessels were designed digitally in a 
program, uh, a drawing program. So they started with a virtual dot uh, and then um, the profile was drawn. It was spun, 3D printed and made into molds. And these multiples were, were made out of that mold. And then they're set up in a form that is a kind of a, a slight uh, um, convex form that's related to another ancient form, which is called an omphalos, which is a Greek word, which literally means navel. And uh, symbolically, it stood for the center of the world. And these, this was a form of uh, ancient sculptures that appear in, in Greece, both on the kind of civic level in the, in the town and also on the personal level in the home, there might've been an omphalos stone and it literally kind of symbolized the, the, the center of the world. So this was maybe um, the kind of, uh, yeah, background to the naming of the piece and what you see there. And what you're seeing here is the salt uh, water over time will crystallize and kind of overtake and encrust the, um, the vessels. Wow, that's so, it's so great. And I love this image. It's so beautiful. And I think one thing that we as viewers really get a sense of is, is salt and sort of the crustiness of it and the, the way that it can, the kind of corrosive aspect to salt. I'm wondering if you can speak to what salt suggests to you sort of symbolically and, and why you felt like it was important for this work. Yeah, you know, at first you don't see that the salt is there. At first it's just a transparent liquid. And so it looks as if water is starting to fill up the vessels. They start to fill and they overflow. And then it's over time that the crystals appear. And so I think there's something really beautiful about the way that almost something comes from nothing or that there's something there that we can't see, but that um, we know um, after the fact that it was there, but we didn't sense it before. It kind of speaks to the idea that there's more in the world than we actually know. It seems that the more we know, the more we find out there is no. And so <laughs> on a very, very small scale, that's what's kind of happening here is that at first you don't see it, and then you realize it's there, it starts to make these uh, really beautiful uh, small geometries that have their own sense of order that isn't something that, you know, I uh, designed for them. It's, a, it's about the flow, it's about the temperature uh, of the room. Um, this took place in Los Angeles, which was actually my birthplace. So this piece kind of had a special connection in terms of um, its, its idea related to that personal fact. The navel, it was uh, LA is your navel, <laughs> it's your own below. <laughs> a little bit. <laughs> um, I want to, I love this notion of not, of like, we think we know things and then we don't know them. And, and I'd love to link that back to the notion of systems and a sort of systemic approach where the, the artist creates a system that generates the artwork rather than necessarily the artwork itself, which was um, an, an idea that was um, circulated by Saul Witt and others, especially in the 1960s and 70s, um, that's kind of linked uh, through, through conceptual art practices. And, and so I'm wondering in this piece, like, what did you think you, know, you knew at the beginning? Like, did, did you have a sense that it would crystallize in this way or to this extent? Or does it have a very different sensibility to it or set of associations than you had anticipated? Well, you know, a little bit of this work gets left up to those who are becoming the guardian of the work after I leave. And so while I had in mind uh, the pace that the salt solution would be added and that kind of thing, I couldn't actually predict how far it would go. I imagined it staying on the top surface and not cascading down the side like a waterfall. And it was a bit more caustic than I <laughs> <laughs> as well. I thought it might react with the metal, but um, but it's a, it's a beautiful kind of um, flow that happened and the... Um, the director of the space, AB Projects, Nicole Seisler, really embraced the project, leaving it exactly as it happened, which, um, uh, which we discussed at a certain point, do we kind of 
clean things up when and and she was adamant about letting the piece uh, have its uh, its make its form and um, and I really did appreciate that. Letting the piece make its form is a really beautiful way to express actually the the tension not the tension but the relationship between yourself and the material letting the piece make its form. I'd maybe this was a question from um, one of the participants, um, which is very closely linked, is asking whether the piece in raw has evolved in the way that you anticipated. How has this piece made its form in expected or unexpected ways? Understanding that, that you haven't seen it for, I know, for a couple of weeks. <laughs> right. You know, um, I think there is a tendency to be a little bit more conservative with um, with how far the piece goes because it is a little bit of a scary thought to think of it overflowing the edges. And so <laughs> scary for us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the end of this exhibition, and this has really been um, a longer exhibition than any of us envisioned, which is really um, a chance to kind of see how far a piece like this could go. Um, I would encourage uh, the gardener to let it really uh, expand and see how far we could get these. Uh, points to grow and what that interaction might look like with the four of them. As it is now, there, it's a bit like a constellation where there are these dots and we can kind of connect them in our um, kind of imaginations into a square and make a kind of order out of them. It might be really interesting to see what the material do, has in mind for the final <laughs> formation. <laughs> what the material has in mind, that's great. And actually it, it, it brings up this association that I had between, so we were talking about the, the material and the spiritual and thinking about the mind actually. And like, it's in a way, it's like the link between the brain and, and, our, and our thoughts, right? And there's something when I see this, when I see this work, thinking about that link between the material brain itself our in our heads and our, our literal brain and our thoughts and sort of thinking of the clay in this piece as our brain or as a brain, just like you said, in a way, and then the thoughts that sort of spring out of the brain or, or are um, hovering around the brain or are electrified around the brain. Um, I think it would be good to, so we've indicated this, but just for, for folks who are, um, who are listening. So the exhibition in this piece were initiated in early March, just before the pandemic, and the museum, like all others, closed in mid-March, and then we reopened in July. And so, in that, in that um, a sort of uh, a pause, when we we basically were able to pause this work in a way, which was it, it's it's interesting to think about that. Oh, actually, you know what? I'm holding. I happen to be holding a um, a sunflower seed in my hand, a ceramic sunflower seed. And, and I was thinking about that pause as a kind of seed in a way, the idea of germination and the notion that you can have a seed that's say thousands of years old and you plant it and add water and light and it sort of springs to life. And thinking about this work, Templum, as being in sort of in hibernation, almost like a seed for the period of closure of the gardener has been an interest for me, an interesting sort of added dimension of its lifespan or our awareness of its lifespan, because now it is, Kind of growing up a little bit <laughs> as a few more weeks or whatever month month and a bit to grow to continue growing um the other thing that uh viewers can't see from this perspective and in this early photograph that they might want to come back and see is that underneath the clay is a layer of steel and the steel which has been able to rust over time and i think there's probably more rust than we or that i envisioned happening because of this delay so the rust actually kind of bleeds up through the surface and this is something that i really don't know what uh, you know in terms of the result of what might happen and what that what that coloration might look like so that'll be interesting to see Mm, for sure. This notion of transformation is so interesting with this work and with the time span of the now and with, with you know, both of these works actually that we've been talking about and, and the time spans. And it makes me think of um, firing as the sort of the primary or customary act of transformation with clay, as opposed to air, water, light and time in a way kind of coming together to, to create that sort of transformation of the material. Um, it's almost like a 
but, but it's it's a different approach. It's like a it's like a heatless firing, <laughs> so to speak. Uh, well, you know. Yeah. We don't really think of water as a ceramic material per se, but it's really fundamental to all the processes. We couldn't form clay without it. We couldn't glaze without it. And uh, I think there's some really beautiful um, metaphors in water and in its it, it, the way that it does transform material in the ceramic processes up to the point of firing. Firing is really the ultimate elimination of water in the mm. ceramic object, um, the kind of permanent elimination. And so this, these works are an opportunity to really experience the changes that clay goes through that the maker sees um, and on kind of put out for the viewer to experience. And, and maybe there's a parallel with the other types of changes that happen in ceramic materials. That was really the moment that I was always intrigued by uh, in ceramics was that opening of the kiln and seeing how what I did changed was changed by the fire. And so maybe these raw installations are a way to have that happen in front of my eyes. Mm, that's really beautiful. And you know, looking at this work, which at Umphilus, which is ceramic rather than rather than unfired, I think one thing that um, that makes it so effective to me in thinking about that idea of water and ceramic and firing being the process of kind of driving the water out of the material is that the the forms that you've used um, allude to the water, right? You have this the kind of glow of the porcelain that can, or the clay that you're using, which looks like porcelain, I think that the um the kind of the thinness of the form that enhances the kind of translucency and brings out that kind of glow and of course the notion of a container of a, of a holder that could hold water so in this piece you've both eliminated the water in a way that like you didn't or like you're working with water differently in, in the template piece so here you've eliminated the water but you've represented it in this really in this really powerful way and I was thinking of this as some kind of intermediary between templum and um, the fired work that I do because it has these two elements kind of com combined, this time element with the salt water and the kind of permanence of the fired ceramics in, in contrast with each other. Mm. And you, you mentioned that the forms that we're looking at here originated in a, um, in a digital software program and kind of 3D printing program. Right. Given that so much of your work is structured around these really elemental components of like like earth and and celestial realm and like fire and water, sort of how how do you think of kind of the digital I don't know world or way of thinking as intersecting or troubling some of those kind of foundational human experiences of the world? Well, I think maybe I was just trying to get at the digital metaphorically, if I could, as this. Um, you know, kind of tapping into that space as this center of the world idea. Um, and it's the thing that's linking all of us right now um, during. The <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sure is. Right, right, right. <laughs> so, uh, so it's something that's so intangible, but I wanted to kind of bring it into this, uh, into this kind of physical uh, space somehow. Mm -hmm. Cool. Um, maybe we would talk, I think we can look at the third work that you brought in our three works. And I'll take this moment to encourage folks who are listening to use the Q&A function of the, um, of the webinar to uh, float any questions that you'd like us to ask Linda. So please uh, add questions. We'll be doing some more questions a little bit further on. Uh, let's see. So Califactum, um, what are we looking at here? Can you tell us about this? So this is a very small piece. And so this is really in contrast to the large scale installations. And it's a porcelain box that is moving slightly in the kiln. It's kind of depressing. And the glazes, there's probably about a dozen glazes on there, are mixing and flowing and melting together in kind of a uh, frozen moment of the time of the melt. And I wanted to just include it in the spectrum of the different 
types of work. It's what I'm working on here at the EKWC in terms of trying to make these a little bit larger and trying to make the experience of glaze something that isn't maybe uniform, um, but rather very nuanced. And so there's a lot of little intricacies and then there's a, a lot of um, maybe coloration that relates again back to our own bodies, our own sense of corporeality, materiality. And so we can maybe in this object somehow kind of sense this connection um, to the material world because it's the material of our body that we experience the world through. So that's what's at the crux of mm. something like this. Wow. So I'm realizing that we don't have the dimensions on here. Can you give um, listeners a sense of the scale of this object? It's five inches by seven inches. Oh, so it's little. <laughs> it's like a yeah. very little piece. Uh, I love that. I'm trying to scale the, them up here, um, although I think there'll be very small details that we might just be able to get very close to, as opposed to the installations, which we are a little bit removed from. Mm. So you've um, connected this work to, to the body and sort of a way of thinking about our own kind of corporal experience. And the, the form of this, especially the kind of profile or the format, maybe let's say, is um, is very rational. It's geometric. It's kind of rectangular. It has pretty clean lines. How do you think about the connection between sort of the geometric and the corporeal? You know, I think that maybe the simple geometry of the form is a way to be able to see that other formation clearly. It, maybe a frame is too simple of a way to explain it, but there is a kind of Again, uh, ordered geometry contrasted with this uh, formation that seems to not be bound by that. So it's in that contrast that maybe we're kind of able to, to read it a little bit more clearly. Mm -hmm. Cool. I, um, I, I, I love this idea of reading and reading it clearly. And, and I think that might be a good... Uh, I think to a sort of idea to draw from that I've been I've been thinking about your work and wondering how you think um, people who are accustomed to ceramics or familiar with ceramics read your work relative to a more general audience. Um, there's, you know, for so I've been working with ceramics for a long time in different ways, and obviously you have for a long time too. And there's very much a sense of like. On one level, there's a sense of a kind of ceramics community, I think. Of, and, and you're in this EKWC, which we'll talk about in a second, which or in a few minutes, which is part of that kind of world of folks who are um, sort of literate in ceramics, let's say. But there's also very much, there's this, uh, you know, all the other billions of people on the planet who don't spend all their time thinking about ceramics, oddly enough. Um, and, and they have often a very different way of, um, we all have different ways of perceiving all of this work. So I'm wondering how you see um, both this piece, but then maybe the other two works too, sort of leading differently to folks who have um, varying uh, sort of levels of intimacy with the medium and the material. Mm -hmm. I think it's a really interesting question. And I am here at the EKWC, which one might imagine it's full of ceramic artists. But in fact, that's not the case. This is a center where there's the technical support for uh, designers, artists who aren't working in ceramics, architects to come and be able to produce work in ceramics. So in, in fact, uh, there are not very many artists here at the moment who have a lot of experience with ceramics. And I think that was really interesting to present my work uh, uh, to them and um, and to talk about it. And maybe what uh, came out of those discussions was this sense in my work of being in control and out of control. And I think maybe fundamentally that really relates to ceramics as a practice in that ceramics, in ceramics, we're working with a certain amount that we can predict or estimate. And then there's a certain amount that is done by the heat of the kiln and done uh, in a, 
out of our hands. And so maybe my work ultimately is kind of investigating that line between what we control and what we don't, what I set up as a situation for the materials to do on their own to a certain extent is about how far can I do that? How much do I need to do? And so it's a very ceramic maybe type of invest uh, practice, but maybe it has a kind of larger um, uh, message or it's not perhaps a message, but a kind of parallel in in the world. So while I think of my work too is quite ceramic or even I come out of this training that's a very ceramic training where I kind of um, uh, test by trial and error and experiment and a lot of uh, the ways that we do with, you know, kind of fired glazes, I'll do that with raw materials. Uh, perhaps it isn't necessary to think of it as ceramic to, to experience it. Um, yeah, I think that one of the, one for me, one of the compelling aspects of, uh, of ceramic work is that it, it operates often on, on those multiple levels at the same time, is that it really does have a sort of specialist kind of vein through it or stream, but it also has a general vein or stream. And so we, um, I think we can look at these kinds of works, like this one in particular, but the other two also um, very much within the framework of ceramics or outside of the framework of ceramics or, or in a larger framework that can contain the, that, um, that kind of familiarity, but doesn't depend on it, maybe. Um, and in a way, this, this work, realizing that we're looking, we've sort of thrown the scale so far off because the image is enlarged, but it's on everybody's own screen. So it could be really, it could be on a phone. Like we don't, you know, um, the scale is kind of now um, infinite in, in this really digital, in this really sort of digital way. But it also is working with abstraction and sort of, you know, working with the kind of, there are absolutely to me references um, to, to painting in this kind of work um, through the format, through the shape and through the, kind of abstract idiom. I'm, I'm wondering if you think of those kinds of questions about how a work like this relates, say, to painting um, in, a, in a real conscious way, or whether you think of that as just kind of coming through the work on its own more. Yeah, I, you maybe think of it less as a, a painting and more like a field, like the field that of the raw clay installation. I think of this surface more like a field where these interactions are happening or this event is happening the way it's set up and and timed as opposed to making you know conscious marks that being said there's a, you know there's a kind of um, relationship to technique or even in the um, in the very um, ancient sense of, of technique or drawing or um, uh, how can I put this, um, using technique and craft in a way to kind of uh, define and um, I'm going back to this other theme of ordering. <laughs> yeah, so, interesting. Uh -huh. Yeah, so um, there there are relationships, but, uh, but maybe I think more um, in this way of, um, of the kind of action um, the kind of uh, transformation, uh, object in flux that is kind of in a frozen moment of flux. Mm -hmm. I think that science is the other word to bring back in there. So there's ordering and there's science. And you do seem to have, uh, there's part of me that can imagine you like as a scientist, <laughs> like that there was a, a point maybe when you were in junior high school, when you were like, am I going to be an artist or a scientist? <laughs> but that it was like a real fork in the road. Is, is, is that... Would, do you think yeah. of yourself in that way? I grew up uh, as a a kind of math and science major. Oh. And only <laughs> so it was it wasn't junior high school. It was graduate school. <laughs> it, was, it was all throughout school. And um, my father was an engineer. And the museum that I went to as a child was the Museum of Science and Industry, rather than an art museum. The first art museum I went to was the Smithsonian when I was sixteen. So that really is my background, this kind of um, experiment, this kind of 
um, uh, experience of a kind of uh, natural wonder or natural curiosity. And there's a really great quote from a early geneticist, JBS Haldeen, who said the, the world will not perish from lack of wonders, but from lack of wonder. And so there's something about that feeling of the wonder of a science experiment that I try to encapsulate in these pieces as well. Mm, that's so fantastic. I'm so glad that we're talking about this. And I, I love this notion that, the, that, I mean, so many, myself included, so many of us sort of have these really early associations. So many of us who are like invested in visual art or care about visual art have these like really deep seated kind of memories of encounters with artworks early on in life. And those are often through museums since that's sort of a customary format, I suppose, for, for finding art. And, and so in this, in this moment or in this age where we're thinking about like what is the museum and what's the role of the museum in society and what's our kind of purpose in society? At least that's in my position as a museum person. That's like something we're thinking about. Um, and and I love this idea that that you're like that sort of that deep kind of love and passion that I heard in your voice thinking about those early museum experiences are grounded in the, in a science museum or in a museum of science and industry, as you said, rather than in an art museum is really I think speaks powerfully to this idea of of what the function can be of these institutions in in different for different people or at different times or in different ways. Not so much like that it has to be when you're at a certain age or something, but that they museum uh, uh, the museum is sort of a conceptual notion. It's an idea that can have um, just the super wide range of manifestations and and impacts. And the way that art interfaces with that too, the, my favorite exhibition from the Museum of Science and Industry when I was growing up was designed by Charles and Ray Eames. It was a one called Mathematica. And they um, had the most fascinating and beautiful exhibits that were interactive in the, in the museum. So maybe I'm just trying to recreate that. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God, your work in the Eames, like I have, that's like a, a little thesis right there. That would be really fun. Like the Eameses and, and you, that's amazing. Um, I'd love to spend our last few minutes, happy to answer more questions coming from the participants if you have them, but I'd also love to talk and hear and learn more about the EKWC. So you're there, you're in the Netherlands. Maybe tell us a little bit more. So again, EKWC is European Ceramic Work Center. And I think also Sunday mornings, is that still like, that's the title of the residency program, Sunday morning at EKWC. And uh, this is a, a couple images from the kiln room, which is uh, just phenomenal. You can see a forklift in that right image moving one of the kiln bases that can be loaded and moved around and, and put under this uh, a hood uh, that is on the left image. I just kind of put those in there to just blow everyone's mind for the scale of what can happen here. And it seems like um, this residency program, which is three months, um, the artists come and stay for three months at a time in order to realize really ambitious projects. And so they're ambitious scale-wise, quantity-wise, uh, material-wise. That's, um, that's really the kind of uh, uh, mindset here is, you know, what can you do with ceramics? And so it's really exciting to see it happen from uh, different participants in different ways. Like I mentioned, they're coming from all different backgrounds and it's a time to uh, kind of live and work together really intensively and, uh, and see just every week they have this rotating system where somebody comes and somebody's leaving. So there's this constant state of anticipation and accomplishment simultaneously. It's really an exciting place to be. That's cool. Anticipation and accomplishment together. And I think so often one of the real hurdles for for working in ceramics is that is that material is the kind of technical part of it or the material part of it. And so it feels like 
you know, the options are really different if you have uh, supportive facilities there, both for ceramic folks, as you were saying, but also for folks who are new to the medium. Yeah. Right. And it keeps coming up that, well, Lindy, you probably know this already, or you can probably do this already because you have experience. But in fact, the materials are out of the earth and they're different here in Europe than they are in North America. There's a learning curve always to understanding your material and understanding its capabilities and pushing those limits. So I feel like I have a base, but still I'm at the same point as everyone here trying to get these materials to, trying to coax them into the forms and things, um, directions that we want them to go. So this is my studio on the left-hand side there. There's beautiful uh, light coming in. It's, it's an enormous space. And so the situation is really set up to just uh, accomplish as much as you can. There's a, there's a crew of ad advisors who have various expertise from kilns to glazing to um, you know, different, uh, um, different techniques. And uh, even amongst that crew of advisors, there's differing perspectives and different ways of approaching the same, same issue. Uh, but there's enough kind of um, imagination and brain power to really get these wonderful projects happening. It's so amazing, the work that has come out of this over the years, a lot of which you can see in the book, The Ceramic Process, um, that is the publication uh, of the organization. And um, we're also in one of these just very picturesque parts of the Netherlands. So if uh, we need some um, some space to think about something, we just go out to the Lake District here and come back into the studio totally refreshed. It's really um, a phenomenal place. So, cool. Thank you for telling us about it. Um, I, you know, we started off um, kind of commenting on how you're, you know, you're in a, in a uh, European residency right now, and how unusual it is to not be in your living room or in your kind of office like I am at home and and, and, and and maybe I would close by asking you maybe the less celebratory part of that <laughs> question which is like how does it feel to be um to be in a in a residency during the pandemic I guess during this time of such um instability and um you know fear and uh risk for so many folks and you know, for all of us in different ways of a kind of a profound, you know, you spoke earlier at this idea of knowing and thinking we know what we know. And in a way, so many of us are in this kind of profound state of not knowing and not understanding. And what does it feel like to be in, uh, in a moment that is centered around cultivating creativity and generating artwork in this moment of kind of profound sort of not knowing and instability? It did feel like a huge risk to come. Um, first of all, to get on an airplane and um, be in an airport that felt like it was an apocalyptic scene from an apocalyptic movie. Um, right. it, was, uh, it was a bit um, uh, difficult to kind of make the decision to finally actually come. And I might have come in one of the very small windows that there actually was because many uh, participants were stopped coming in the summer and uh, now uh, just yesterday we closed up again uh, in the Netherlands in terms of the restrictions on movement and that kind of thing. That being said, there we're in a bit of a um, pod here in terms of the artists who've come and we live like we're a family so we're sharing meals and we're all together and um, and uh, there is uh, always maybe a little bit looming this risk of of something kind of coming in and um, being infectious but it also is a time where many of the projects are responding to the moment of of being separated from one another being um, being socially distanced, which is the main kind of 
tack of the of the Netherlands more so than the mask wearing. It's been separating um, space wise. So there's kind of projects relating to that, and then there's just this um, feeling that we have this s- such unique. Uh, opportunity to be able to manifest something at this moment and um, and trying to seize that. So we are uh, feeling a bit of um, uh, a bit of um, a bubble like feeling here because things are operating somewhat normally and that feels very strange to most of us because we came from a very um, uh, adapted reality in the summertime. So we are trying to almost feel a kind of normalcy that doesn't feel like we maybe should get very comfortable feeling. <laughs> um, uh, but, uh, but believe it or not, we are still functioning until something happens. There's <laughs> that looming sense that at any moment, something could um, in- burst the bubble. Yeah, right, right. We're in these bubbles and um, they can change at any moment. So right. um, in the meantime, though, you're there, you get to make work, you get to have a giant kiln with a forklift <laughs> floor and all of that. It's so, the um, most luxurious ceramic experience <laughs> I think I've ever had or will have. Yeah, I can imagine. Well, I, I celebrate you for that. And I hope it's I hope it's really generative for you. Um, and thank you. Thank you again for, for being here. Thanks for having your work in RAW. Thanks for sharing your work with us today and for helping us kind of learn more about it and understand it and sparking a bunch of ideas. So, yeah. And thanks to you, Sequoia, for all of the great conversation and questions and, and dialogue around the work. I really appreciate it. Absolutely. Really glad that all of the folks who are watching could join us today for this three works with Linda Swanson from the Netherlands or in the Netherlands right now. It's been really fun. I'd um, like to encourage uh, folks to join us on October 29th. I'll be speaking with Heidi McKenzie, an artist based in Toronto on the theme of legacy. So it should be super interesting. And there will be lots of, um, there'll be links and info about that coming out of the Garden Museum. So Thank you again, Linda. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon, and we'll see you next time. Okay. Be well.